In this series of videos I'm designing this Z80 based computer system. The book detailing this is now released and I'm moving on and carrying on with the development. The um, book takes it up to version 3 of the board. Now that version will support everything we're looking at here but does not include the details of the floppy drive interface which is what we have on the breadboard here. That's what I'm now working on. So from the basic system I'm starting to add the more uh, complex subsystems. So the next things on the drawing board are the floppy drive interface and the DMA system. So they're things that we would have found on the um, type of vintage machine we're looking at and aiming to uh, really emulate here. Um, but just to clear up a bit of confusion, I've been asked a few times about which um, terminal I'm using here. This is not a terminal. The case is from a terminal, but all that's in here is a CRT and the small uh, driver board for it. The Z80 system generates all the required drive signals to drive the CRT directly. There is no terminal here. Um, having said that, it does have RS232 and I've been using that from a remote PC just to transfer data for uh, developing the firmware and the software. Um, but as I say, this is not a terminal. This system outputs data directly to the CRT system. So on with the development. The first thing I want to get working properly is the floppy drive interface. From that point, we'll move on to DMA. I will detail the floppy drive interface circuits in future videos. I won't do it now because it is a work in progress and it might change depending on um, which direction the development goes. It is working quite well at the moment. Um, so this system at the moment will support single density, single sided, right up to double density, double sided. Um, anything from one drive up to four drives. So it's working quite well. I've been testing it fairly extensively, but the next thing really I need to sort out is to be able to boot the um, Z80 into an operating system. So the approach I'm taking with this, it might sound a bit convoluted, but it's to keep the system as flexible as possible. So the code I've written at the moment in the monitor program, notice there's now an extra option at the bottom that says bootloader. And what that does is it loads the vector that's stored in a RAM address. It's initialized by the monitor at boot up and it uses that vector to branch to the actual bootloader, the first stage bootloader. And the reason I've done it that way is because it means firstly you can substitute the vector for a completely separate bootloader but also the same mechanism can be used for first and second stage bootloaders. So the first stage bootloader for example could update the vector and then by calling it again it will um, basically jump to the second stage bootloader. So that's the way this system works. Now I've got a formatted floppy disk here and um, I've shown how this uh, system formats the disks. I'm using the IBM format so all the payload data is um, loaded and stored when we format the disk. The target address I'm using at the moment for the bootloader is 9000 hex. So if we have a quick look at that, notice it's all A's at the moment and that's because the self-test um, leaves that value in all memory addresses when we do the self-test. So the self-test we can repeat as well. And during the self-test the status LED comes on and it will go out at the end of the self-test. So it tests quite a few things including all the RAM and if there is a fault detected it will flash a code on that LED and it runs that test at boot up. The other thing it does is we now have non-volatile RAM. So there is a byte used in the non-volatile RAM that's uh, it's used to determine what the system will do at uh, power up. So it will look for um, a boot disk. If it doesn't find a boot disk or can't successfully boot from a boot disk it will revert to the monitor or you can have it set to jump straight to the monitor in which case you then boot it by selecting the B option from the, the um, monitor. 
So if we try and run this with a formatted floppy disk, so put that into the drive. It's not going to boot, of course, but the way I've um, written the software in the monitor program is um, it should cause the machine to reboot if it can't um, successfully branch to the monitor. So if we try and um, boot from this floppy disk, as I say, it's formatted, there is no code on there. Notice that nothing much has happened, certainly nothing useful. So we can see that nothing's happened, it hasn't successfully managed to boot. We just had the message saying booting from floppy disk. That message is created by the, um, the part of the code in the monitor that selects the uh, vector for the actual bootloader and it wasn't successful. But if we now dump the memory contents from 9000 uh, hex, notice that the values have changed, they're now all E5. So E5, if you recall, is the value that we store on the floppy drive sectors when we format the disk. So it has successfully loaded the sector. And the way the bootloader works is it loads the first sector from track zero on the floppy disk into RAM and then it tries to hand control to that code that it's just loaded. This is double density disk, MFM encoded, so there are 256 bytes, which is more than enough for most first stage bootloaders. And so what would normally happen is you'd load the first stage bootloader, it would then uh, be handed control of the machine and it would then uh, complete the booting of the machine from floppy disk. So if we swap the disk and we put one in, I've written a disk or some code that I've put onto the disk that it's, it doesn't really do anything other than put a message up, but it does prove that the system is capable of uh, booting from floppy disk. So if we try and boot again, it will go through the same process. It will load the code that's on the first sector of the first track on the first side of the floppy disk. It will load that into this same address and it will try to run that code. So what we should see on the screen is initially it should say booting from floppy disk. I'm just going to raise the camera a bit to make sure you can see the top of the screen. So we should see a message at the top initially for a second or two saying that it's, low, it's uh, booting from floppy disk. And when the code that's loaded from the floppy disk actually runs, we should see a different message appear on the screen. So we'll try and boot. And as we can see, it has successfully branched to what would be our operating system. So what the code does that it loaded, if we have a quick look at the code, we can dump that. It's at 9000 hex, as I said. You can see that's the code that we loaded. It was all AAs, it's now the actual code, doesn't do very much. It really only clears the screen and puts up a, uh, a message on the screen and changes to bank zero. So from that point on, the next thing it would do is load the operating system. And of course, the next thing I have to do is write that operating system. But fundamentally, you can see the system is now running. It's capable of um, booting from floppy disk We've got the mass storage. This is not normally how you would uh, use it, of course. This is really where something like CPM would come in that allows you to handle mass storage using files and that type of mechanism rather than having to think about sectors and tracks. Um, that's really only uh, all that uh, CPM does. But once we get to this stage, then we've got all the tools and hardware we need to actually write a full operating system. And uh, although at the moment we're not using DMA, we're using programmed in-out, it will work just as well, albeit a bit slower than using a system with DMA, uh, but it will still operate in exactly the same way. So you can see making progress. Um, as I say, I will go over the details of the floppy uh, disk interface and the code that is uh, being run in future videos. Um, but the first step is to get something actually running. So I'm going to write a very minimal operating system that will just let us do a few things to prove that it's running in bank zero.
and uh, from that point on we can start looking at a full operating system. And we'll also be implementing a version of CPM on this machine and now that we've got this far it will of course be very straightforward to actually get that running.